So similar to last week, for those who were there last week, uh, this is going to be really, really informal. So I do have slides that I'm going to go through, but at any point, if there are any questions, please stop me. Uh, and we can, we can talk things through in a bit more detail. Um, also, because uh, we already gave a presentation on grad score to uh, some uh, best crop participants, uh, I'm not going to cover everything. Uh, I, I, I thought I'd focus on the things that are probably the most useful when you want to get started using grid score rather than explain everything uh, all over again. Um, right, so, um, you know, we, we all know why data collection is important, uh, particularly why the, the quality of the data that's being collected is important because that data uh, can make its way through follow on trials and data analysis and might eventually uh, end up in publications. Now, if that data contains any errors, those will also propagate or can propagate all the way through to a publication. Now, obviously, that's not something that we want. You know, we obviously, we want our data to be as, as good as possible when we when it comes to publishing. So, making sure that you know the data that is collected is as accurate and um, as complete as possible is is uh, key in this case. Um, now there are some common types of errors that can happen. Um, you know, things like number swaps or decimal point issues where you've got the decimal point in the wrong place. Uh, these can happen quite easily. Um, and you can see an example of that here. Uh, so on the left hand side, we've got a number swap or uh, it's the 91 here, which should be a 19. But if you look at the data distribution for that, then, you know, that 91 skews the data distribution quite significantly. Um, so it's, it's a clear outlier in the data. And if we can prevent those types of errors uh, during the data collection, that would be useful. Was there a question? No, okay. Um, for the data decimal point, same thing. Uh, you know, this is one error in this, this series of data points here. I'm not sure if you can spot it. Um, but, you know, there's one data point that's clearly an outlier and that's just because the decimal point was in the wrong place. Um, so errors like that happen very, very easily. Uh, they're quite easy to avoid. Um, so, you know, having a tool that uh, lets you do that is, is quite useful. Um, now, the other, the other types of errors, you will be familiar with those, you know, the, the differences in the way the person collecting the data will perceive something. So someone will say the flower color might be dark purple, whereas the other one will say medium purple and so on. Uh, it's just important to have, you know, distinct categories and provide reference sheets so that everyone knows what they should be scoring and so on. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these because I think there are more interesting things to look at today. Um, so that brings me to grid score then. Uh, again, some of you will have seen this in the last presentation we gave. Uh, so this is a tool that we've developed at the James Hutton Institute for data collection, and it combines a huge set of, of features and functionalities that you might want when you're out in the field. Uh, so it offers, you know, a field plan like overview of the data. We will see that in a second, uh, but crucially it uh, offers data validation and data verification during the data collection as well. So that, you know, the, the error rates are kept as low as possible. Um, it also uses georeferencing to let you know where you are in the field and to record those locations uh, so you can use that information later on. Um, it supports image tagging um, so you can you can take pictures of plots or individual part, uh, parts of a plant and all those images will automatically be tagged with uh, the corresponding identifiers and timestamps and GPS coordinates um, so you know that the image contains as much information as possible. Um, there are quite a few data visualizations in there as well, which also work completely offline. So while you are collecting the data, you can immediately look at some data visualizations just to double check if the data that you, you just recorded looks, uh, looks sensible. Um, and there's also barcode support and touchscreen support, obviously. Um, now what we see down here then is that it runs on pretty much any device. Uh, so it will run on tablets, mobile phones, it will run on your desktop as well. Um, so you know you can you can set up your trial at your desk and then you can use the, the same app on your phone to collect the data and the data is synchronized between them um, without uh, too much too much hassle. 
Um, during these demonstrations uh, and the presentations that I usually give about grid score, I usually focus on field trials. So, you know, you've got your plots uh, in your rows and columns, usually a fairly grid like um, layout. And you can see uh, Miriam Schreiber from our Bali group here collecting some data on some Bali plots. Uh, but just because I focus on grid like field trials, that doesn't mean it can't be used in other scenarios. Uh, it can also be used for data collection in the glass house or polytunnel, for example. It can be used for data collection in the lab. Um, but also, you know, for survey type data where someone just goes out into, you know, uh, into the wild somewhere and, and collects data on, for example, trees. Um, there's some people here using the app uh, out in Vietnam and also down at the bottom left at the James Hutton Institute. Um, so that was a training course that we gave two years ago in Vietnam. Uh, we also gave a training course uh, one year ago, actually, in Vietnam. And we gave one last month in India as well, similar type of thing, um, where uh, you know we we just run through uh, the app for two days with people just to get them up and running. Now th these are the other things that I can talk about during this this uh, short training. Um, since I have shown the app previously. I and I have shown the user interface and the data visualizations. Uh, last time I did not show the data, uh, the, the creation of a trial. And so I thought that would be quite good to show today. Um, so I will briefly run through the other sections again, just for those who weren't there last time, uh, and just to remind you as well. But I will probably focus on the creation of a trial because that's probably what you uh, want to get going with first if, if you decide to use GridScore. Uh, so, you know how to create your own trial, how to collect the data for that and so on. Um, so, yeah, just a reminder for the user interface. Uh, this is kind of what the app looks like. Um, this is a screenshot from it running on my laptop. Um, and you can see, you know, the main navigation menu along the top that takes you to the data entry, data visualization and so on. Uh, on a mobile phone, it was looks slightly different, so that the menu is kind of hidden in this uh, this so-called hamburger menu at the top that you just click on and it expands and it collapses, um, just so you know that the the options might be hidden in the menu up there. Um, you know, there's different options for light and dark mode and different languages. I don't think that's too relevant in this case. Um, but these sections here will be quite useful when you use it the first time. Uh, so there are things like uh, quick uh, links to creating a new trial, importing a trial that someone else shared with you. Uh, you can also load an example trial. And there are three different ones that you can load and look at just to explore the app a bit. And then some settings as well. Now, further down the front page uh, is where you find all the trials that you have on your device. And in this case, there are two. Uh, one is one of the example trials, it's, it's the Bali trial here, and one is a trial from our training uh, on GRASP uh, last year, uh, should be 2024 actually, because it was this year. Uh, but yeah, it's just it's easily, you can easily switch between the different trials uh, if you want to collect data for more than one uh, at a time. Yeah. So the main workflow um, when you use uh, an app like this, or specifically if you use GridScore, is that you would start by setting up the trial, and you can do that uh, in the comfort of your office on your desktop, uh, have a cup of coffee as well, and you can easily just copy and paste stuff from stuff like Excel uh, to the app, just because it's, it's much easier to do stuff like that on the on the laptop or the or your desktop. Um, that's also where you provide all the, the, the information that's required for, for a setup, and I will show what those are in a second. Now, once you have created the trial, you can share that with the mobile phone or tablet, whatever device you use for the data collection, using a QR code. Um, and that's really, you, you just create the QR code on your laptop, and then you take your phone, you scan that QR code, and that's the whole trial transferred to your phone. Um, you can then use that mobile device to collect the data. Uh, at the same time, you can look at visualizations as well while you're out in the field or also back in your office on your desktop because all the data is, is synchronized between the different devices so that everyone always has the latest data. 
Uh, and then at the very end, once you're done with your trial, you probably want to export that to uh, some format. Uh, and to, as part of this project, it might be the Germinate data templates because you know Germinate is being used as part of this project. Uh, so you can easily export your data from grid score into those uh, Germinate data templates. Um, right, so the data collection, now this assumes that you already have a trial. Uh, and I'll show how you, you create one after this. So this is just a reminder for um, you know how you collect the data once you have a trial. Um, so this is the the main view of the app, which is kind of like it's just a representation of your your field plan. So you've got your rows and your columns. Uh, each one of these cells is a plot, uh, and the colored circles represent the traits that you want to score. Now each trait has got a different color. The fact that all these circles are empty just means that no data has been recorded yet. Um, now, again, this is a field trials layout. Uh, if you are just recording data in the lab or the polytunnel, you will just have a list of things rather than, you know, a table. Uh, so it will look slightly different, but the main functionality is basically the same. Um, now to, yeah, there's also a trade overview here, which shows you all the trades that are being scored as part of this trial. Um, you can, they, they're being, in this case, they have been grouped together in trade groups that just differ, uh, that just represent different stages during the trial. So you've got your growth stages for barley in this case, you've got your pre-harvest trade and also a characterization trade. All right. To record some data, you would just click on any of these plots. You get the data input for each of the different trades um, and you know your trade groups and all that. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this particularly because I would want to uh, I want to focus on the trial setup. Um, but these slides we can share them as well. Um, so you can have a look through them uh, at your own at your own pace. Now, once you've entered all the data for a particular plot, it's going to update the main data, uh, the, the field layout. You can see that in this case now, all the trades for this plot have been scored, all the data has been entered. Um, so kind of the, these circles kind of act as a as a progress indicator as well. Um, now, as time progresses, that will you know more and more data will be collected, and it becomes more and more uh, colorful. Um, but if you look at the, the trade drop down, you can see that all these progress bars are only about a quarter of the way uh, through. So even though you know the plots that you can see have all been scored, there are more plots further down uh, the, the trial that haven't been scored yet. Uh, so again, there's a bit of a progress indicator for each of the trades uh, here as well. Um, I'm going to skip this for now. I might come back to that if there are questions about different ways in which you can can collect the data. Uh, because I, I showed you how to click on a plot, but there you can also use barcodes or you can use a guided walk, which will take you through the, the trial as well. Uh, and I can come back to that if there's interest uh, in that. But let me go to the uh, the trial setup, which them in the wrong order actually here we go right so how do you then get to that point that i just showed where you have your trial set up in the app uh, and you can collect data for it now there are a few things that are required uh, to get to that point and i'm going to break break that down here on this slide so basically what we need to know are the the field plan and um, so in this case since it's a field trial, we need to know the number of columns and the number of rows. And for each of the plots, we need to know the germplasm identifier. And if you are using reps, the rep number as well. Now these germplasm identifiers, and I highlighted that during the data template uh, training that we ran last week, these identifiers need to match all your other data that you are providing so that you can link it all together um, and all, all the data is, is you know, well integrated. Uh, again, if you're not using a field trial, if you've got your, your plants in a, in a polytunnel or glasshouse, or if you're collecting data in a lab, that's fine as well. In that case, the number of columns would just be one, and the number of rows would just be however many individual uh, plants or plots or whatever you want to record data for. 
Um, so the other thing we need are the traits. Um, now the traits are just, you know, what is it that you want to measure for those individual job plasma entries? Uh, and there are two things that we need for those uh, at least. One is a name, uh, and you can see three trade examples here on the right. In this case, for Graspi, uh, we've got the growth habit, the flower color, and the plant height. And then the other thing we need to know is the data type. Now, the data type can be either numeric or categorical, or it could be a date, for example, or just free text. Um, and these data types help the app to, you know, make sure that the data that's being entered is uh, as accurate as possible. So, for example, for a, a, a numeric data point or a numeric trade, rather, it will not allow you to enter any text, obviously, because that's not a number. Uh, for the categories, it will only allow you to pick one of the predefined options. Again, trying to increase the data quality as much as possible. Um, the set size then is just a setting that determines how many individuals you want to score per plot. So if you are, for example, recording the plant height for three or five individual plants per plot, you would set the set size to three or five, however many individual recordings you want to take, basically. Um, now, the last thing here are restrictions. Again, those are there to uh, ideally increase the data quality for the uh, uh, categories. Uh, these are basically the, the options that you can predefine. For example, for the flower color, the categories would be white, blue, violet, or whatever in this case. Or for the growth habit, it might be prostrate or erect. Um, for numeric data types, you can define minimum and maximum values just to make sure that everything is within a certain range. Uh, in this case, we've defined the plant height to be at least 10 centimeters, but we didn't define an upper limit because we were just not sure what that might be. So what that looks like in the app itself then is shown here. Uh, so this is the, the trial setup screen and you will see uh, the, the two sections that are highlighted earlier. So the trial layout is this box down here and the trades as this box as visualized by this box down here. Now, in addition to that, you kind of need to give the trial a name. That name should ideally be fairly descriptive um, so that, you know, if you're just scrolling through your list of trials, it's easy to identify. Uh, that can include, for example, the year or the project name, just to make it easier to find. Uh, and you can also add a description as well uh, if you want to provide any other meaningful information about the trial. Oh, yeah, we're going to have these. Uh, so the trial layout then is what I mentioned earlier is where you define the dimensions, uh, the germplasm identifiers, and so on. And the trade section is where you define the trades. And we will now go through these two sections specifically. So for the layout, um, you have these different tabs. Um, only the first two are required. The other two are just there for um, visual aids, basically, uh, during the data collection. So they may or may not be useful for you. Um, first of all, you have to define the dimensions. Again, uh, I'm assuming a field trial layout here. So the number of rows and the number of columns have to be specified. And you can decide which way you want them numbered. So some people like to start the numbering in the top left corner. So the top left would be plot one, uh, row one, column one. Other people start in the bottom left, where the bottom left is row one, column one. Uh, it just depends on your on your preference, really, and you can you can set these here. Now the next tab then is where you actually provide the germplasm information. So because I picked um, what was it six rows and four columns. We've got four columns in this table here, and there are six rows if you scroll further down. Uh, so each one of these table cells is one of your plots. And what we need here is the germplasm identifier, which goes into the first text box, and optionally the rep number, which goes into the second. Now, rather than typing them all in manually, um, which you know might take a lot of time if you've got a huge trial, uh, there are some import options here. Um, so you can import things directly from stuff like Excel, or if you're using uh, something to create your layout for you, 
Um, those tools will usually spit out the data in a particular format, uh, so in a field book type format. Uh, there's an import option here for that as well. So if we select the, the first option here, for example, um, that just gives you a text box or a file selector where you can just uh, paste the data in from Excel, for example, and it will fill the, 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 the table for you. Similarly, for the field book type in, input, again, a text box that you can paste your data into, or you can load a CSV or text file or whatever uh, and extract the data from that. And basically, when you do that, um, it's gonna it's gonna pre-fill uh, this table with the data that you copied and pasted from uh, another tool uh, like Excel or you know field a field book type uh, application like Field Hub. Um, the other two tabs, as I mentioned, are more for uh, visual aids when you're collecting the data. So you can define the corner points, for example, of the trial which will then show your, your position while you're walking through uh, the trial on the main data display. Uh, and you can also define visual markers. So sometimes people have got uh, stakes every five plots or so, and you can, if, you, if you're using something like that, you can define them here. So once you check that, and it's going to run a few checks across your data when you, you click the check button, just to make sure that if you have duplicates, that you either provide a rep number for them, or you can uh, accept the fact that there are duplicates in your data and it will it will just continue on from that. Um, it's, uh, it just runs a few checks across it just to make sure that you know the data is is correct. Um, now the second bit then was the the trace definitions, and as I said, the the, the name and the data type uh, are the only two that are required. So the first field here and this one down here, uh, but the other ones may be useful um, just to give more uh, more of an explanation for the trade, how it should be measured, what unit should be measured, uh, used, or so on, um, and also the the restrictions as you can see down here are also available. So the first two, again, are just details about the trade itself. Uh, so a name and optionally a description. Um, then there's the data type, which has got different options for numeric, categorical, date. Uh, there's now a range one as well. Uh, different, different options you can choose from. Uh, and also you can group different trades into the same groups. So if you've got trades, for example, that you're scoring early in the season, you can group those together and trades later in the season, you can group those together so you can hide uh, the other ones if, if you're not scoring the data for those particular ones. The restrictions then, because this is a numeric data type that we selected here, so you will have the option to define a minimum and a maximum. Uh, you might not want to use that depending on what the trade is, but it just helps to keep the data within within the range. So if you know, for example, that the, let's say, the plant height is never going to be more than 200 centimeters, uh, you can define that there and that makes sure that, you know, you're not hitting the zero too often and you want to enter like a 2000 value or something. Um, again, the set size, I mentioned this earlier, is uh, defines how many individual um, plants you want to record data for per plot. Uh, in this case, that has been set to three. So whoever collects the data will have to enter data for three individuals within the plot for this particular trade. And the set size can be different for each of the trades. So some of them you will score for three individuals, some of them you might score for five individuals, and some of them are just scored for the, the plot as a whole. Um, so that could be things like, um, just the, the establishment percentage for the whole plot. So how many of the individual plants within the plot have actually uh, reached the establishment stage? Um, so that would just be a set size of one in that case. Um, scrolling further down, there are some other options here. Now the first one determines whether you want to allow repeated measurements. Now that's useful if you want to record a trade over time, for example, so, for example, if you wanted the plant height measured uh, just during further the whole trial duration, 
like every week or so someone goes out and records the, the, the plant height. In that case, you would want to allow repeated measurements. For other things like, for example, in Bali, the row type, uh, you know, there, there's no point in scoring that multiple times because it's not going to change. It's either two or six. Um, so in that case, you wouldn't allow repeated measurements just because there, there's no point in recording the same thing multiple times. Um, the last thing on here might be useful to you. It might not be. Um, it just allows you to define uh, date ranges in which the trade should be or has to be recorded. Um, now that can be switched between a suggestion or an enforcement. Uh, and if this uh, enforcement is, is selected, it will only allow data input. Oh, hang on. Data input within that date range that was defined. So outside of that date range, it would prevent any data input for that trade. Now that can be useful if you know the, the person collecting the data isn't super familiar with the trades and they they're not entirely sure when a trade should be recorded. Uh, you can give them suggestions for that, and it will highlight that on the user interface just so, so that they know when a certain trade should be uh, should be recorded. Um, there are some options for importing these definitions as well. Um, so if you have lots and lots of trades, uh, you might not want to enter them manually in here and, and pick all the options. Uh, so there's uh, different ways in which you can import the data in different formats. Um, once you have trade uh, trials in in the app as well, you can copy trades across to a new trial. So if there are, if you've got multiple trials that all record, for example, the plant height or the flower color or whatever, uh, you can just copy the trades across, which saves you some time, uh, so you don't have to enter them again. Yeah, you can also make changes here. So once you've added a trade and you realize, you know, there was a there was a mistake, the set size here should actually be five or something. You can just select that again and make the changes on the left. Uh, you can also duplicate or delete them from this list as well. If you just uh, notice that you need to make some changes. Uh, yeah, and you can change the order by just dragging them uh, up and down. So if you want them in a particular order, you can do that as well. Right. Um, so at this point, I'm probably going to stop just to see if there are any questions so far. Okay, I don't see any hands up or anything. Um, Paul, oh, which bit do you think is most interesting to show now? Visualization or synchronization? Um, I think the visualization stuff, but actually both. If you do do, do both, yeah, yeah, we've still got a bit of time. Yeah, right. Um, so yeah, once once you have collected some data, and this you know this can be during the trial, this can be at the end of the trial, at at any point really. Um, you might want to look at the data as well, and there are a few different options for doing that. Um, now, the first one are heat maps. Um, heat maps are very good at highlighting patterns in the data. Um, now, that could be things like uh, edge effects, so where the, the plots around the outside of the trial have got lower or higher values than the rest. Um, it might show up the uh, areas of the, the field, for example, that have been waterlogged or something, and you would see that the values there might be different from the, the, the rest of the trial. Uh, in this case, we're looking at plant height, and you know there's no obvious pattern uh, that we can see on the left-hand side, uh, which is you know just a representation of your field layout, again, with the rows and the columns. Um, and the darker the value, the higher the, the plant height in that case. Um, now, the right hand side, it's also a heat map, just showing the data in a different way. In this case, it's a, it's a replicated trial. So you've got four reps for each germplasm entry. And what we show here is just each rep, or the, the reps for each germplasm next to each other. Now these are quite good at seeing if there are any inconsistencies between the reps, because ideally you would want them to be relatively similar. Um, we can see that this one here, for example, uh, 
the third rep has got a, a value that's quite a bit lower than the rest of them. Um, whereas this one here looks fairly consistent. The first one might be a bit higher than the rest of the, uh, the other three. Uh, but it looks fine. So again, this, this is just a way of highlighting potential errors uh, in the data, just to see if there are any, any obvious outliers. Um, yeah, and you can see an example here of a, a barley trial that we, we had at the Institute a few years back. Uh, and these values in this column here are a lot lower than the rest of the trial. And the reason for that could be that there's only one guard row on this side of the trial, whereas the, 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 the trial is a, a lot better protected on the other three sides from the weather. So that could be one explanation for why these, these values are lower. Um, but again, just heat maps are good at, you know, just highlighting these things so that you can then go and, and have a look at the data just to see if if, if anything actually uh, happened there. Um, some more heat maps in this case, uh, categorical data. So we can't just plot numeric data. We can also plot categorical data for uh, in these heat maps. Uh, so you can see the flower shape for potato. I think this might be on the left hand side. Uh, and on the right hand side, we see a replicate heat map for the row type in barley. Uh, and again, for the row type between two reps, you would not expect that to be different. So it's either two it's either, or it's six. You would expect one rep to be two and the other to be six for the row type. Um, now, if you're recording data over time, uh, this is the, the setting with the repeated measurements that I mentioned earlier, uh, you can uh, a timeline slider will appear for the heat map, uh, and you can then use that to just move through time and see how that trade developed over time. So in this case, it's the number of tillers, um, and you can see how that increases for the individual plots uh, as, as time moves on. Um, another time-based plot is this one here, also for trades that are scored over time. Uh, you can see for each plot here is rep represented by an individual line uh, and the individual measurements taken for that particular plot uh, are these data points here. So you can see how over time uh, the values of individual plots changes uh, and see if there's any correlation between the, the time point when that happens, for example. Um, the last one on this slide is again, like a time-based, uh, visualization that for each trade just shows the plots scored as a percentage. So this just shows you how much of the data for that particular trade has been collected over time. Uh, and you can just see that for these three trades that we see here, uh, the shape is just very similar. It's just offset here by about a week and here by about a month or, or six weeks or so. Um, so it gives you an idea of the, the, the relation of the different trades as well, how they're offset uh, by a few weeks. Um, there are also some box plots or statistical diagrams for categorical trials. These will be uh, uh, bar charts, um, but for numeric trades or date-based trades, we can plot them as, as box plots. And again, these are really good at highlighting potential outliers or just showing you the distribution of your data. Um, so you can, you can spot things like, for example, these five data points that look to be quite a bit higher than the rest of the data. Now, that doesn't have to be an error. It could just be that these are five plants that are particularly tall. Uh, and in some trials, you know, the, the extremes are actually the data points that are most interesting. So you might be looking for the, the tallest plants or the shortest plants or the ones with the highest uh, disease resistance or lowest disease resistance or so on. Uh, and these box plots are very good at highlighting uh, those extremes. Um, so for the data synchronization then, um, now this is about how you get your data from one device to another one. Um, and also how it, it, it's kept synchronized between those devices. Um, now, I mentioned that this is being done by using QR codes. Um, so usually you would probably set up the trial in your office uh, while you will be using a mobile device for collecting the data in the field. 
and the way the, the data is shared between those is just uh, facilitated using QR codes. Um, you can also use this to split up a trial between different people. So if you've got three people in this case uh, scoring data for the same trial, uh, you might want to split that up by a plot so that you know Alice only scores one plot, Bob scores all the green ones, and Claire scores all the blue ones. Um, or you might want to split it up by trades instead. So for most of the plots, Bob will score data for the first three trades, and Claire will score data for the other three trades. And for some reason, Alice will do all of the trades for this plot, for example. So mm -hmm. the different use cases um, for why you might want to split up a trial between people as well. And obviously, if you do that, you know that there needs to be a way to synchronize the data all together. So in the end, you have the data from, from each one of these. Um, and what that might look like is shown here. So if we just look at Bob and Claire in this case, and you can see their devices uh, on the left and the right hand side, respectively. Um, now, if Bob and Claire go out on one day and they collect some data, so Bob has scored the first three trades for these plots that we see here, and Claire has scored the fourth trade for exactly the same plots. Um, now they've also added some text comments, uh, as you can see by this this icon here, uh, and they've also highlighted or bookmarked a few plots uh, just for uh, for some reason. Um, now we also we, we want to make sure that, that that data is synchronized between them uh, between the different devices. Now, if Bob is the first one who decides to synchronize, uh, the app will tell him all the changes that he made. So he made eighty six changes, so he, he uh, added a comment or added some comments, he marked a few plots, and he collected data for 28 individual plots. Now he can then synchronize that, which will uh, make use of our grid score server, um, and you know, just give him his, same, his data back, because Claire hasn't synchronized her data yet. Now if Claire does the same, it will also give her uh, an overview of the data that she recorded, she will then synchronize her data. And at this point, what she gets back is her own data, which was the blue trade, but also the other three trades scored from, from Bob's trial over here. Um, and you can also see that his uh, Bob's comments and Bob's bookmarked plots have also made it across to, to Claire's device there. Um, now, if Bob then uh, refreshes his device, you will be notified that someone else made changes and he can then load that new data onto his device as well, at which point both of them have got exactly the same data on their device. And you know, Claire might also pop her, Alice actually might also pop her head in and look at the data at some point as well. Uh, if she wants to look at the visualizations, for example, on her laptop, she can do that. Um, you can also use this to give the data to stakeholders, for example, um, so you can give them a view code, which will only allow them to view the data rather than make changes. Uh, and then they can load that data onto their device and just look at look at the data, for example. Um, now, at some point, you will want to export that data as well. Um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's great while it's in the app and you can look at the visualizations as well. But usually, you know, it, it should end up somewhere else um, in, a, in a database like, for example, Germinate. Um, and there are various data export formats uh, that can be used, uh, tab delimited file formats for export into Excel, R, or Python, or so on. Um, there are German data template exports, which will be relevant for this project, where you just export the data straight into those templates, and then you can send those templates to us, and we can, we can upload that data straight away. Um, and there's also the, the breeding API, which is a standardized way of data exchange, uh, plant breeding data exchange. Um, so you can also export the data to any breeding API compatible database. Um, now what that looks like then is if we use the, the tabulated data export, it will actually generate a text file, but you can just open that up in Excel um, and it will kind of look like this. So you've got your, your jump plasm entries uh, along down the rows with the, the rep number, row, column, and so on. And then the, the traits uh, are in here as the, the, the column headers. 
and the data is just filled in based on the date uh, where the data has been recorded as well. Um, in the data export for Germany, it looks very similar. Uh, it's a very similar structure to, to the tabulated data export, just that it actually uses the German data templates. So you have got all these tabs down here that are highlighted in the, the training section last week. Um, and all the data is uh, is entered in, in the correct way. So you don't even have to worry about any of that, any manual data manipulation. Uh, you can just send those data templates straight to us and we can then upload that data for you. Um, yeah, so if you have to find the trial layout as well, in terms of the GPS coordinates of the, the corner points, um, then what we can use that for is for visualizations like this one here. So this is Germinate with some trials data that's been recorded over time, and we know the GPS coordinates of everything. So we can actually plot them on a map, heat mapped, and we can also show individual plots, uh, how they develop over time and so on. So, you know, there are, there are quite advanced data visualizations within Germany that we can provide uh, depending on the, the data that we get uh, as part of a project. Um, and I guess that kind of concludes the, the data workflow or the, the grid score workflow, actually. So I highlighted how to set up a trial and I realized that this was fairly quick, but we only had an hour. Um, and we will make these slides available as well, so you can look through them uh, again. There's also online documentation as well, which uh, is linked to from these uh, slides as well, so you can read through that. Uh, but also just get in touch if there are any questions. Um, but basically, yeah, so we started with the, the trial setup. Uh, I showed the data collection as well. We covered the data visualizations, data synchronization, and data export. Um, so we've looked at all of these um, at some point. Uh, do we want to do advanced features as well, Paul? And it's already been quite a lot that we went through. I think based on time, we should probably maybe leave that just now. Yeah, I mean, it's in the slides if you want to look through, uh, through them at some points. Um, it's just things like image tagging and so on is explained as well. But yeah, you're probably right based on time. Uh, we should probably leave it there. Um, so there are some links in here as well. Um, so this is the link to the app itself. Uh, if you are using Android devices, there is a dedicated Android app that's available as well, um, which is basically just a wrap up for the app. Uh, it makes it a bit more a uh, bit, bit easier to use on an Android device, but it works fine on, on iPhones, iPads. It works, as I mentioned earlier, it, mentioned, it works pretty much on any device. Uh, there's documentation available at this link. And again, as I mentioned, any questions or feedback, just get in touch with me uh, and, and I'll help, help you as best as I can. Uh, yeah. Hi. That was basically it. I yeah. have a couple of questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I start, Nicolas? Oh uh, yeah, it's just a quick one. Uh, I didn't catch how to synchronize the data. I didn't found found the option uh, uh, on the grid score. Uh, so if you can show again, sorry for this, but uh... yeah, that's all right. Um, let me actually show that in the app itself. Um. Let's make that a bit bigger. Right. So if I just select, right, so let's share a trial first. So the, the, this is the app running on my laptop, right? And I've got yep. four trials, trials here. This one uh, has not been shared yet. So I can go ahead and share that, which will generate the different QR codes, which you can then share with the, the other people who are going to collect the data. Mm -hmm. So, depending on whether you want them to only view the data or edit the data, you can send them a different QR code. Now, once I've done that, um, I can then uh, make some changes to the data and save that. And at that point, there's this button up here, which will show up, which tells me I've made four changes to, to the trial. Um, and if you click on that, it will give you the 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 thing that I showed uh, on the on the slides, 
where it tells you, you know, I've, I've made four changes to the data. Uh, at the same time on the front page, if we also give you this corner button here, the green one, that highlights that there are local changes that have been made to your trial and you should click on that if you want to synchronize them. Okay. And again, if you, if you click on that, it will pop up with this and then you can just click synchronize. Uh, yes. And at that point, it has synchronized all your changes. Okay, so as long as you, you add some traits or something in the trio, then you, you will be able to synchronize the data all the time. Yes, yeah. Okay, okay. And um, I have a second question, which is more about the organization uh, over the desktop project. Um, do you plan to have a common template or something which will be available for everybody? Because, for example, for us, uh, the main trait will be about characterization, uh, fire retardancy, mechanical properties, these kind of things. And uh, of course, we will not have an overview of the field trio and all the, the genotypes, uh, phenotypes that will be um, tested. So will it be uh, something like a common template for all the partners and then we can just add the traits or do we need to organize ourselves to, to create the trio? With all the, the the phenotypes or genotypes, I think um, I think that's up to the project members to decide if they mm -hmm. want to use use this as a tool or not. Because it makes absolute sense if everybody's going to or, or or some people are going to use it that that there's coordination with regards to defining of the phenotypes and things uh, that that could be shared amongst that group. Um, so I think I think the thing to do would be to go and have a look at it and have a play about with it and work out if you think it's useful. And then I guess maybe try and get some consensus through uh, Kiara if it's something that would be beneficial to the project mm -hmm. and we think people should be using it. Yeah, because I, I'm sure that that would be very interesting to compile all the data and that is very, uh, I will not say easy, I will try it first, but uh, at least it, it, it looks very nice. And I think that uh, if we can uh, have a common template and then just add the data at the end, we will have a very nice uh, overview of all the characterization, uh, all the, the data that will be compiled by all partners, and that would be very interesting for me. I mean, at the end of the day, the data will all go through tools like Germany anyway and be brought brought together. But the advantage, if, mm. if this was to be used, the advantage is that it's, it, it deals with a lot of the formatting and stuff that you need to get to get into that format. So. But we should we should definitely have a, a discussion about it. Have a play about with it first, and then and then maybe send out an email saying what you you think of it and if you think it's going to be useful. And then, um, I'm okay, sure. okay, perfect, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Chiara. Please, uh, I have finished my question. Thank you. Uh, so I have a couple of questions quite similar to the one of Nicholas. So the first one is that. Um, is it possible to modify the trial setup one, once it has been defined? And if it's possible to modify, there is somewhere in history or a chronology of all the modification, so we know that someone else modified the trial setup or only the owner can modify it? So the, there are a few things that can be changed once a trial has been created. Um, so you can add more traits, for example, that's, that's easy enough. Um, okay. Other than that, the things that you can change are the name, description and group and so on. Uh, and you can change the names of the, the traits. You cannot change the data type of the trait. Um, what you can do though is like if you realize that you made a mistake before the data collection takes place, um, what you can just do is you can use the duplicate trial option here, uh, which will basically take you back to the setup, uh, just filled with all the, the information that you previously defined, and you can then make changes on here. Now that will create a new trial. But as I said, if you if you realize a mistake before the, the data collection actually takes place, then that's not an issue at all. Um, once you have collected some data, there are limits to what we can what you can change just because the, the data synchronization uh, becomes extremely complex if, for example, you change the data type of a trade from numeric to categorical. What if someone has already collected data, numeric data points, and you then change the, the data type to categorical? That makes it very difficult. 
which is why we, we, we currently don't allow that. Uh, and when it comes to the history, we do not keep a history of the changes that have been made or who makes them. And there are reasons for that just because some people are very wary of their name being associated to certain changes just because they don't want to be blamed at a later date. Um, so we decided not to keep track of who made what changes. It's just you should only share the trial with people that you trust, basically. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. And the second question is uh, what about the people that work uh, in the best crop that work in the greenhouse? So they have really, really few samples, few plants, not uh, row and columns of plants, but few sample. Are they going to use uh, this grid score or not? I mean, ultimately, that's up to them. I mean, you can you can absolutely use it in a glass cell. So if I just define a super small trial, you know, ten individuals. Uh, that that's what I mentioned earlier. You just have a list, basically, rather than a grid in that case, right? So I could just define. Well, let's just do five because I don't want to type them all in. Uh, can I just jump, jump in before and, yeah. and just say that we're using it in a glass house internally for our best crop work here at the uh, yeah. Dave Sutton Institute. So Ke Kelly and uh, our team are, are will be using this in a glass house. Yeah. So basically, rather than defining a grid, you would just define a list of things. Um, so if I just have these A, B, C, D, E, uh, let's just say those are the, the germ plasm identifiers. Um, and then I just define one trait. I keep using plant trait as an example, uh, plant height. I should probably use a different one at some point. Uh, but let's just add one trait, create the trial. Uh, and then it just looks like that. So you just have a list of things and you have your one trade in this case, or it could be as many as you want, really. But instead of having the grid, you would just have a list. And you, you can you can absolutely use it in the glass house, uh, no issue okay. at all. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you said it, you probably said it as well, Sebastian, so I apologize. But the other thing is, if you're using like a laser scanner for barcodes, the order doesn't matter either. As long as you scan a pot and you know what's in the pot, it doesn't have to be in specific order. Yeah, so it was saying as shown on uh, this one here. So basically, this is an, this is an example from our uh, Raspberry trials at the Institute, and they have got these barcodes next to each individual plant. Uh, and basically, if you scan that barcode with the app, uh, it will pop open the data input for that individual. So if you have barcodes on the pots, for example, in your glass house, uh, you can use those for easier identification of the, the correct entry in that list of, of, uh, of germplasm. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. So, uh, th so thanks everybody for coming along. Um, as Sebastian mentioned, what we'll we can send out the presentation that will have links to resources that you can have a look at. We'll also um, I'll take this video and just edit off the ramblings at the start by me, um, and and along with the one that we did last week on grid score um, on germinate templates, we, we can make those available to people as well. So um, you should get an email from us soon. So, okay, and Paul, just one question: Did you yeah. send? Did you send already the the Geminate presentation and the video or not? No, it's not. It's it's sitting on my desktop. It's something okay. I, need, okay. I need to do. Okay. So, okay. um, we'll, we'll get we'll get that sent out. But maybe both at the same time. Um, okay. over the next okay. over the next couple of days. Thank you. Well, if there's nothing more, no more questions. Um, thanks again and. We'll see everybody soon. Enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. See you later. Thank, Thank you very much. much.